super. I don't know about you guys, but for me, this is like a crazy reunion. I've known some people in this room since I was 16. And I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but it's more than a couple decades. So, um, oh, right, there was one whole thing that I was going to do. Okay, first of all, thank you, Andrew, for letting me use your space, for having this. And thank all of you for coming out. I really appreciate it because it was a bit of a last minute thing to come up here. And um, so how many of you have heard Light Struck Light other than the fact that you're here to listen to it tonight? This is new for a lot of you. Okay, a lot of you have been tortured by me talking about it a lot. Um, okay, so how many of you are familiar with Straw Bale? Okay, so good. Okay, Cobb. This should be if you've looked across the street here. Um, so Light Struck Light, basically I've written this book here to kind of flush out a lot of the holes and written information about this building technique. And um, basically I like to say the best thing since sliced bread, but actually light struck clay has existed long since industrialized bread production and slicing machines. So let's see here. Okay, so in the hay is light straw clay. So for those of you who don't know exactly what it is, this is a really basic definition of it. And light straw clay has a lot of different names. So some people call it slip straw, light clay straw, the German word for it is Leichlumbau. Um, pajareque is the Spanish word for it, but um, it's an infill system made of loose straw mixed with a clay slip and it's packed into a wall system either using temporary or permanent forms. So that's the basic definition. Um, brief history is that it evolved out of Europe um, coming out of the development of half timbered or timber frame homes where these little light colored sections basically didn't have anything to fill them with and traditionally people filled them with something called wattle and daub. Wattle being almost like basket weaving of branches and daub much like mud daubers or dauber birds using um, mud to infill that um, space right there. And then as we evolved towards the 17th century, timber, this is a long story, but um, as logging increased to build homes and ships that there became less um, fuel for building fires. And so people started coming up with lighter and different infill systems. So they started to incorporate more straw, which is actually lighter weight and adds more insulation. Um, and then how this technology got to the United States was basically through Robert and Paula Baker Laporte have been building with this technique for over 20 years. They were based out of New Mexico for a long time and they build a very specific type of building structure that uses Japanese timber frame with a light straw clay infill. And um, I have a lot of gratitude for the work that they've done. And part of this book is a way of flush, um, flushing out different wall systems and different ways of incorporating light straw clay in the building. Um, so the major components are clay slip, which is just essentially dirt with clay in it that gets mixed with water and the clay particles are in suspension and you use that as a binder that coats straw. And your most basic method is you have a table for small projects and you pour clay slip on it and it beads up and it becomes a binder that wraps each little strand of straw in clay so you can see how it sort of changes color and in the back of you can see how it sticks in um, and then for bigger projects which ideally um, for those of you who have worked on projects with me doing light straw clay there's a handful of you in the room you know that it can be kind of labor intensive so this is a way of upscaling to a bigger scale where we use the tumbler and the tumbler is essentially a culvert, which is just a big piece of tubing on a little motor that's electric, so it's quiet. And there's clay slip that gets mixed. It's not shown in this picture, but just like those 35 gallon barrels, it gets pumped up here and is fed via gravity and kept in suspension by happy half-naked people keeping it mixed up. And then it, you put the straw in and it tumbles through the tube. And the nice thing about the tumbler is it's quiet. So this is a nice advantage for anybody who works on conventional construction. You know that the job site is generally noisy. So this keeps the noise factor down and it really um, minimizes a lot of the labor because you can do all of this with one or two people instead of 12. Um, and the other thing, the other hallmark of light straw clay is that you're using formwork and it's either permanent where we have a reed mat that gets rolled up and stapled in and all your light straw clay kind of gets poked in from the top or a wood lath, which is just little strips of wood that get stapled on your vertical members and then your light straw clay gets packed in there. The advantage of this is that you can pack it in with less density so you can get a little bit better insulation quality. 
and then you have this nice substrate for plastering over. Or what most people do is that they do a temporary formwork, and that is where you have this plywood formwork, and it just leapfrogs up, and you're packing the lightstraw clay in there. And then I always put that coffee and baked goods really help <laughs> every building project. Um, so one of the great things about lightstraw clay is it goes with any framing system. So for anybody with um, natural building experience, there's pros and cons to all sorts of different framing systems. So here with light straw clay, because you need um, a superstructure because it is non-load bearing, is it works with split studs. So any conventional carpenter can frame this. Um, they could probably frame most of this, but this um, it becomes a good hybrid or a segue between conventional construction to natural construction. So with a split stud, you can have a continuous insulation layer so you get much better insulation value instead of breaking it up in bats like we do currently. Um, timber frame which is a very beautiful elegant way to showcase big timbers in your building and with a lot of these particularly when you have the big structural members is you have a secondary frame that goes through here that helps support your light straw clay or deal with your openings like windows and doors and so this is a Larson truss so I don't know how well you can see it but it is two small pieces of wood, like two by two, maybe two by four, held together with a little gusset that kind of determines how wide your wall width is. Um, so that way you can use smaller diameter wood, which is great at a lot of levels, I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, and then you still get that continuous thermal envelope, so you're not breaking up your insulation in stud bays. And then pole frame, so if you can see right here, round pole, anybody here work with round pole? before, yeah, a handful of people. Um, it's very hard to blend round pole work with conventional materials. So I feel like the, there is a perfect quote unquote marriage between light straw clay and pole frame materials because poles are not perfect tubes, they're actually cones and coming from a carpentry background, it's very hard to work with cones instead of rectilinear things. So light straw clay marries perfectly with pole frame construction. And that also works great with conventional. You can cram it in there and it still works great. And I'll go into some other um, awesome virtues of it working with conventional construction. And then the et cetera is that whatever your superstructure is, whether it's brick columns, cob posts, what have you, straw clay can work within it. Whereas some of the other natural wall systems might have a little bit more of a challenge to work with. Here are just a little architectural detail so you can see where there is framing in order to make way for um, continuous insulation with straw clay. Um, with my experience being primarily straw bale, there are a few projects where I haven't incorporated light straw clay. And one aspect of that is that on the south side of any building where you're trying to make the most of passive solar design, where you have a lot of windows and doors, is you have a lot of framing. And if you're trying to put straw bales around framing, you're using a chainsaw, you're cutting notches, it becomes complicated. And sometimes you end up really compromising the insulation and the integrity. So light straw clay becomes a really great way to still get your insulation, still use straw, still use clay in the south side of your building just because you have all the framing to work around. Here's the other thing, we're in Portland. Um, there's a lot of pre-existing structures. And here is the Planetary Re Repair Institute in Southeast Portland. It's a little blurry picture, but they did one of the first permitted light straw clay retrofits of a pre-existing structure in Portland. And this is legally permitted. So there's two realms with natural building. One is that a lot of people do stuff under the radar, totally support it, it's awesome. And a lot of people are trying to do stuff above the radar in order to make sustainability legal. So this is one of those great leaps in terms of making light straw clay something that you can go to the permit office and get a permit for because when you're in Portland, you're most likely in a dense place where your neighbors are looking at what you're doing and you don't want to get dinged by the county. Um, so this is one of those great projects because in Portland, it's hard to find raw land in order to build your dream home on. So I imagine that some of you here are probably contemplating building a home sometime in the future out of something probably straw oriented. Um, so you might not necessarily have to think outside of a pre-existing house in order to get a building um, that you are attracted to for various reasons. And here's another retrofit where we just use reed mat to encapsulate light straw clay in the wall system. Um, so what's so awesome about light straw clay? You'd think I would be done by now, but I'm not. There's 10 more things. Um, but there's two things I'm gonna say before we do it. So there's two things that are 
what might be considered challenges around light straw clay. And one is the labor consideration. It, from one perspective, it's labor intensive. From another perspective, anything that's labor intensive, you can call it a work party and have a good time because light straw clay is low tech. It's really easy to do. It's great for kids can be involved. People who are and don't have the same abilities as your average construction worker can be involved in this process. So there's, um, yeah, there's a great kind of co potential coming together of people in order to work on your projects. So for some people that's labor intensive, for other people it's a work party. The other thing that's challenging about light struck light, particularly being in the Willamette Valley, is that it takes a while for it to dry. So the average is a week per inch. And in order to meet energy codes, you need a 12 inch thick wall. So you're looking at 12 weeks of potential dry time. However, because light straw clay is so versatile, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, is there's lots of different ways to kind of work around that limited dry time. Um, here we go. So number one, you have a breathable wall system. So for anybody who has heard of sick building syndrome or familiar with that or has particular chemical sensitivities, has asthma, really struggles when the weather gets dry breathing in their house. Any of your breathable wall systems, particularly if they are clay-based, do a great job of regulating humidity in that space and also mitigating any mold formation as long as it's been designed well. And so there's a huge difference between water in your building and water vapor. And as living, breathing human beings, we're constantly generating vapor. And most residential structures will require that you have some form of mechanical ventilation <coughs> kind of suck that out of there, but if you have a clay-based wall system, you have the ability to absorb that and maintain really good humidity base that's benign for our, all of our like mucous membranes so that when we're in a house, the air quality is really good. Um, there's also really great research that's been done on clay walls and indoor air quality based out of the University of Texas where they created these little squared off rooms and covered them in a clay plaster and then put new carpet in there. How many of you love the smell of new carpet? So good. Um, anyhow, so it's basically a way of testing um, participants' subjective response to the air quality in that space and then also monitoring how the um, clay walls actually mitigated some of the aldehydes that are being emitted, emitted by carpeting. Um, so clay-based wall systems or breathable wall systems are great and you will always have to work around that when you're doing a natural wall system. Number two, it's non-toxic. So clay, which is basically the premise of almost every natural wall build building system with the exception of ice building, which we're not gonna do here because we don't have ice or stone. Um, so people pay a lot of money to have clay wiped on their face because it has this ability to absorb toxins from our bodies. And one part of that is that that is generally contains a negative charge and a lot of things like bacteria and viruses have a positive charge so it neutralizes and binds to those things and pulls them out of our body. So anybody who's ingested bentonite clay or has put it on their face, they know that it has this great ability to absorb toxins. This whole slide could probably be like an hour long slideshow in terms of how amazing and awesome clay is because when you zoom in on a microscopic level it's just really tiny particle and um, it has a negative and positive charge on either end and the way that the little platelets stick to each other kind of turns in anybody remember these from like Spencer's and the mall <laughs> and really fun magnetic sculptures um, that they're very plastic and they bind well and um, there was one really great paper that came out or I can't pronounce this word is anybody a clay nerd Montramillanite it's a form of kale and clay, but it's extremely microscopic, very tiny, and they are suspecting that it played a role in the formation of DNA. So it's a clay particle that's instrumental to life. And you can go back and find all sorts of different um, cultural relationships that we have with clay. Like we've used clay pots in order to build up human cultures for eons. And we could go on for hours, but I'm gonna go on. Okay, here we go. Um, local materials. So here's one thing, just like the main thing right here is you're minimizing your ecological footprint. If you don't have to transport stuff from really far away, like a lot of the green building materials that come from somewhere else, manufactured in a factory, mined from somewhere else, processed, and then you get something that in theory has a green label on it. But if you're looking at truly local materials, then you're really minimizing your ecological footprint. And you also have long-term repairability. So a lot of modern materials, they might not be here 20 years later when that industry goes bust or collapses or whatever. And then the other thing, this is a big topic, is that it's architecturally resonant of place. So if you have place-based materials, they really speak to people in a place making their life. 
Um, so here's the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. This has been continuously inhabited for a thousand years. And it's totally, you can't see it, seamless from the landscape. So there's certain pros that just depends on your, what you like architecturally. Oh, there you go. Sorry, hit the button twice. It's fun to do. Um, I think I've roped a lot of people in this room into various work parties, and I would like to think that we had a pretty good time, and we had fun. Um, kids can be involved. For the most part, I rarely see anybody really grumpy, other than maybe sometimes myself. Um, when I'm tired of burning out on a job site, but it's really simple work and it's also quiet work. So you can sit there and you can have a conversation. Whereas if you do conventional construction, you usually have your earmuffs on, your eye protection, everything. There's a loud generator going, a loud compressor, and you don't get to converse and have a good time. It's also beautiful. So these over here are some of the Laporte's Eco Nest. So it's a Japanese timber frame with light straw clay. Very beautiful, very elegant. Here's some other examples of light straw clay. It's a brewery in Southern Oregon. Some of you might recognize that in Portland. <laughs> you you. want to talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other show. Um, so here, number six, lucky number six. This is probably the key to why light straw clay is the most amazing, is because it is the most versatile. If any of you know Mott's Merman, he was one of the like pioneers of the straw bale movement. And he says, you can do anything with a straw bale wall except for make a skinny wall system. Um, which, when you live in an urban environment and you have a limited amount of square feet in order to put your structure, you don't necessarily want to have a wall system that's 18 to 22 inches thick when you have straw bale. I love straw bale. I think it's great. However, light straw clay might be more appropriate when you have limited space. So here, super skinny wall system, light straw clay. Still get great insulation. Bricks. There are a group of people in Alaska where they have a very small building window for when you could actually install your light straw clay in order to get the R value that you need for dealing with an Alaska winter. So their solution to the problem was to make bricks. Increase the surface area, get your bricks dry, then put them in the wall. Then you still get the advantage of having light straw clay building without the disadvantage of having to wait 12 weeks for it to dry. Um, here's an example of that south side on a, light, on a straw bale building. So here we really couldn't fit straw bales in a way that we're really going to work there, so it's light straw clay. And then here's another very thin wall system that's at Dignity Village. So also, you can do them in any shape, any dimension. It's amazing. It's kind of, they're very versatile for wall systems. Soundproofing. This is Madeline. <laughs> this is, you know, my daughter. And I just love how this worked out. So soundproofing, it does a great job of deadening sound in there, and particularly this is a straw bale project in Portland that has multiple bedrooms upstairs and for anybody who shared a wall with somebody else, it's nice to not hear what's happening in the other room. So it has really good soundproofing qualities. Fire resistance. This is another key amazing element of light straw clay. With each little piece of straw being wrapped in clay, it basically does not combust, does not burn, it will smolder. So you can see I'm having some fun with the blowtorch. And particularly after the North Bay fires, um, uh, Dave Arkin and Annie Tilt, they're architects who do primarily straw bale, they did a bunch of case studies on the straw bale buildings that survived those fires. So really the only thing that burns in most buildings, other than the asphalt roof, which is totally flammable, is the wood that's exposed. So um, I can talk a lot, about, a lot about that, but if, particularly living in the West, we live on a landscape that's shaped by fire, maybe not as necessarily in the Willamette Valley, but most of Oregon, fire is predominant, so building a wall system that's non-combustible is a good thing to do. Number nine, this is a big deal, carbon sequestration. I thought I'd get all like bar graphy here, but um, the biggest thing to remember is that straw sequesters 60 times the amount of carbon it takes to grow it. So that gives it the lowest carbon footprint of any insulation material out there. So if you were to make one choice about your building and wanted to do something carbon, sequest carbon sequestering wise, you could add straw to your building and sequester a lot of carbon. And then here is just a lot of info about that the building sector consumes the majority of the energy in North America. So if we can sequester carbon and use energy efficient buildings, we can make a huge dent in terms of what's going on globally. Um, and then another little statistic is in 2015, the, um, there were 6 million building permits issued, and there are 14 million vacant homes registered. So we could do a lot of retrofits, make a lot of things a little different. 
Number 10, I like to add this in there. So who's ready for the fall of capitalism? Woo! Yeah. Um, and one little bit, I don't know if like every construction project is gonna do that, but what sustainability really is, it's about shortening your, shortening your dependencies. Capitalism depends on you to be dependent. Some of, I might have ruffled some feathers, but that's okay, we can talk about it later. Um, so if you're able to shorten your dependencies, then you're able to live a more sustainable life and you're able to enjoy your life more. So the literal definition of what a mortgage is, is a death grip. And you can choose between a 15 year adjustable rate death grip or a 30 year fixed rate death grip. You can pick one of those or you can put it in your own sweat equity work and build as a community and build a house that is economically affordable, ecologically affordable, and hopefully step yourself outside of something um, that maybe we're not really benefiting from. A little Winston Churchill's quote, supposed to quote there, but um, so we shape our buildings and therefore they shape us. And I forgot to do this in the beginning. I had a lot of coffee today. Um, but normally I make a little request that everybody take a little moment to like visualize the place that they feel the most comfortable, the most at ease, the most inspired, um, something that really symbolizes the place that you feel the most content and have a sense of belonging. You can do that for like two seconds. Um, oh, never mind. We'll do that in a little bit. So <laughs> I forgot I rearranged it. Um, so here's just some more things because light straw clay is so versatile. There's a lot of little elements that I think people feel like they can't incorporate in a lot straw clay, light straw clay building, and that's the curved edges that you normally get with cob and straw bale. So I just wanted to show that here I'm using sono tube formwork and regular formwork in order to get that. You want round? Here's a round light straw clay building. And note here that it doesn't have a roof. I'll show another one that doesn't have a roof. And this is one way to mitigate or to increase the airflow in there so that your building dries quicker. Because it is, and this is really vulnerable. Anybody who ever builds knows that when you don't have a roof, everything in there is, like, it, Murphy's Law says it'll rain. So um, here's another example. You can kind of look at this. They have their formwork. They're building from the outside in. Clearly it's raining because they're wearing raincoats. But they also have this exposed corner, so you don't have to have posts on the outside. You can just get really creative with how you're going to wrap your building in insulation with light straw clay. And that's one thing that I really like about it, because with straw bale, you're kind of limited by the number of strings and where the strings are located according to your superstructure, unless you're doing load bearing. Um, this is kind of a blurry picture, but this is in Germany, and this is using really minimal wood to have this super insulated structure. And for those of you carpentry nerds, like this is a huge fan. This probably weighs like 300 plus pounds of insulation. And they just have this like really sweet little truss system. So it's a way of really mitigating our reliance on big timbers and coming from the Pacific Northwest where we're told that logging is industry that kind of keeps the state running, but mm, we've probably done it in an inappropriate way. So a way of utilizing smaller timbers out of our forests a whole other topic, but I just thought this was a really great example of using minimal amount of wood, maximum amount of insulation, um, and big openings. So back to that question that I asked you earlier. So <coughs> when you think of home, what do you think of? And so I love this picture because it really puts something in perspective, particularly because this looks like a nice chestnut tree, which is one of my favorites. Um, the Laportes, when they give a presentation, they usually show a picture of a door and they say, their quote is, why would you leave nature outside? So that's one thing about natural building that I'm really drawn to is that creating a space that really is reflective of, because I can imagine for those of you that thought about where you feel the most comfortable and the most content, almost always picture somewhere outside. So. Why, how can we do that in an architectural way to bring that on the interior of our buildings? This is one of my favorite quotes of late. The ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make it differently. David Graeber. <coughs> so here are pictures of people making their world and this is what a lot of us spend hundreds of, or tens of thousands of dollars traveling to go see something that feels like an authentic human experience. And these are all beautiful architectural reflections of place, perspective, spirituality, culture. And they're all using natural building materials. All sorts of cool pictures. Clay. Wood. I love that one. Stone. 
another favorite one. And this is also a very place-based building. That's Dignity Village. And to conclude, I was end with the butterfly effect quote, is that the butterfly effect is, long story short, trying to come up with a mathematical equation that could explain weather patterns based on math, because in theory, if we live in a world made of all sorts of little particles, we could explain it mathematically. But in the end, realizing that everything is just so profoundly interconnected that even the seemingly innocent and insignificant fluttering of butterflies' wings can cause a tornado a thousand miles away, that whether you relegate yourself to the position of consumer, like you're just gonna go consume products and hopefully make the best choice, to whether you're in a position to be a producer and you're doing all sorts of things, not just film production, um, that we're all at choice to a certain degree and that those, are, those effects are cumulative. So hopefully you'll choose to build Lights Rock Light. Um, <coughs> so we can turn the little lights on and if anybody has any questions, thoughts, comments, criticisms. I recently read an article about some kind of new method of some kind of slurry that they're spraying on walls that are helping with earthquake um, proofing instead of doing the um, big metal X braces. Stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if maybe light straw clay might be because they said when the earthquake happened, then it like it helped mm -hmm. to keep it together and so it didn't mm -hmm. fall apart. Do you think that might happen with light straw clay? It, it it's mm -hmm. more like a, oh, let me think of a good analogy. It's, it's not <coughs> structural, so it's insulative, but straw does have incredible tensile strength, which is why that big pile of dirt known as the Cobb building entry, we were just joking about that. It's Cobb, but it's cantilevered and it's leaning. It's the straw, it's the tensile strength in the straw that helps distribute loads in that. So if there was a way to create some kind of composite, which is just a mishmash of materials that had really good tensile strength that could deal with whatever an earthquake were to do. I could see something like that happening, but it would also probably have to be relatively weather resistant. Mm -hmm. So light straw clay, if exposed to rain and wind, it doesn't have the straw, the tensile strength, because the straw is just the insulation. It's not structural. The clay is the kind of binder. I think um, they were doing this on the inside, like a basement walls and stuff. Yeah, I would be curious to read more about that because That's usually you're looking for some kind of structural matrix that can just distribute loads all over the places and all over the place and particularly when you can come up with a composite that has a lot of redundancy in it like the turn like I've got an engineer in the room. Hi Tyler, you've been so good. Um, future engineer. Um, that has a diversity of particle sizes, a diversity of you know tensile strengths over different areas, they would handle an earthquake really well. Yeah, but I don't know if light straw clay would be effective in that way. Mm -hmm. But you could, I mean, Cobb does really well. So there was, a, there was a test that took place in Canada with a Cobb building on a table. They got the thing up to like nine point something on the Richter scale until the shake table broke. And the building was still considered inhabitable. So that's a testament to something that has really good tensile mm -hmm. strength and is really good in an earthquake. Um, but light straw clay would really depend on the superstructure okay. for that. What's the, the R value like? Thank you for asking that question. Um, so it depends on the density, but ideally, under ideal conditions, and I'm going to say some numbers, and so 13 pounds per cubic foot will generally, depending on the straw, um, generate uh, 1.9, 1.6 to 1.9 R per inch, and R is just resistance to heat flow, and it's how you measure any insulation. So you go by the pink stuff, and you get R19 or R21. So you would generally have to have a foot thick wall in order to meet R21 for your energy code. So, but I mean, here's an interesting story about case studies and how they come up with those numbers. So um, in straw bale, they did two tests, and these are really expensive, so it's a big deal when you get them done, because it's like tens of thousands of dollars to have your wall system tested. And they did one where they stacked the straw bales vertically, so it means that it's taller this way, your straw bale, than this way, and they plastered it, plaster dried, and they tested the R value. Then they did the next one where they stacked the straw bales flat, and they were in a hurry. So the plaster wasn't actually dry when they tested it for its resistance to heat flow. And so evaporation causes cooling, and a wet substrate will radiate more heat than another one. So it actually registered as having a lower insulation value than a thinner 
wall system. I feel like I need a little bit of a drawing. But then those numbers stuck because it came out of the fact, the like engineering lab that does those tests. And then everybody else spreads the word. It's like, oh, well, if you stack them vertically, you get better R value. But in reality, the story is that the test was incomplete in my mind. So I think in a in an ideal situation, they have done tests with light straw clay, but I think that the more testing you do, the better you would come up with numbers because it would really depend on was your insulation over a large wall system tested or just a small wall system where it was broken up by more vertical wood members that have lower insulation. So, so the equivalent R21 or whatever it is, that's how thick of that, how thick would that be in fiberglass? Um, it depends like on, walls? yeah, you could get an R21. Oh, thanks. Sorry, you have weird blood. Am I like, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it just depends on, like, if you use a rock floor or a fiberglass or a cellulose, and you could do that in a two by six wall. However, that is just the insulation in that stud cavity. It doesn't mean that your insulation value is represented in your two by six wall or your two by six stud that's right there, which you're going to get five and a half. R right there. So that's where it's called thermal bridging where and so there's a little stud here and there's a stud here and there's a stud here. There's great insulation here. There's not so great insulation here. So it brings your whole average down. That's so that's why you have the, the, the double. Yeah. So if you really want a good thermal envelope, you could still use conventional insulation, but you would want to do a better job of it. And then if you then superimpose that on like how construction actually happens, Carrie can testify that like at the top of the wall, it starts to sag. That's where all your heat leaks out of most buildings. Like that's a weak point in any project. So there's, I don't know, the R value is basically a number that we're trying to achieve, but the practical application doesn't mean that we have actually achieved that. So you can you could do a really great straw bill house and do really poor detailing at the top and have the same performance as a two by four wall. So that's the sad truth. So you have to have quality and focus. So what's the, the legalities as far as getting it approved on building codes? Another great question. Oh my god, I should have paid you to come here. Um, so it's 2018 and light straw clay is now in the International Residential Building Code. There's a copy of it in the back of the book. It's totally legal. You just follow your prescriptive path. Really what ends up happening is that you just have to have your structure engineered. And depending on what you're building, that should be relatively simple, but it would be considered legal. So you could present it to any jurisdiction and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. So any jurisdiction exists in the international yeah. building code? Mm -hmm. okay. Yay! And that was like a lot of hard work from the Laporte's, the guy named Martin Hammer. A lot of people have put um, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making that, basically sustain, um, legalizing sustainability. So, fun. Anything else? Hey, thank you. Um, do you ever need to use anything for pest control? No. Um, I have heard one instance of termites inhabiting a light straw clay building, but with everything being coated in clay, and ideally you have minimal seed head, um, which sometimes is because you're loosening the entire straw bale is that you can see if there's seed head in there, but the only reason um, rodents or insects would want to be in your wall is because there's food, shelter, and or water. And you know, shelter is kind of a given because you're building the structure, um, but there's, there shouldn't be any food there. And then rodents don't really like to chew through dirty straw so far, as I've observed. Um, the only issues that I've seen, particularly with earthen plaster, are sometimes mason bees and big bumblebees like to burrow into the clay plaster, but that's the only thing that I've seen. So, so you're creating habitat. Yeah, you're creating habitat, hopefully for humans. Win -win. Yeah, as long as you clean your countertops, you won't get sugar ants, so you're fine. Um, and then it really is a function of all your detailing. So if you create holes in the bottom and a warm space that has food in it, then you might encourage rodents, but that's true of any anything ever. So ideally good detailing, but in terms of inhabiting your wall system, there wouldn't be channels and anything for them to get into. Okay, Carrie's got a question. I have lots. She's got lots. Fire away. Who's this Larson? Larson. Trust system? Yeah, I should have the history of Larson Trust. Larson was a genius. Um, so the uh, Larson Trust is just a really awesome way that I would probably even consider framing for conventional construction, where instead of say you want a foot thick wall system, you don't have to go by a two by twelve. 
A, it comes from a really big tree, and B, it costs a lot, it weighs a lot, and with a Larson truss you would get continuous insulation. And your electrician will love you because they don't have to drill any holes. Mm -hmm. And or your plumber. So those are advantages. And electric clay, you can run electrical and plumbing through electric clay. So I recommend conduit if you're ever going to do anything again in the future. Like we yeah, the plumbers and electricians come first. Yes. Otherwise, they'd be very dismayed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and there I tried to get some info on how many lights truckly probably under the radar structures are in Portland, but I think there's a fair few. So, Tyler has a question. It seemed like he has one. I know. I, Tyler, you've been so good. Sleepy time. I tried to put you to bed, but you all stayed awake. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, so then uh, books in sale for sale on the back, sliding scale, if you so choose. And did you guys sign your names? Let's do the raffle. <laughs> Gotta stick them in here. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, I totally expect someone to run up here screaming like this price is right. This is true. Come true. <laughs> okay, here we go. Jerry. Wow. Yeah! <laughs> Um, super. Hi. Haven't seen you in a long time. Um, so it happens when I don't come to town very much. I see a lot of old friends I haven't seen in a long time. Anything else? Questions, comment? Dean seen me present like the most out of anybody in this room. I'm surprised you don't have some feedback. <laughs> I actually, I, I ran into a guy yesterday. I just went into town, as you know, and um, I was talking to a guy and he works at Homeless Post. I forgot what nonprofit. I said, have you ever seen Dignity Village? And he said, yeah, that's like a model for the entire country. What? I said, yeah, like, it's a good friend. I felt all proud. <laughs> Big group effort. Yeah. You know, I was sad to see the Right to Dream 2 isn't downtown anymore, so I don't know where they are. But um, Yeah, Dignity Village probably hosts the most natural buildings in one spot in Oregon, as far as I know. So they have, I don't know how many at this point, but seven plus light struck lay buildings, a little straw building. So they're leading they're leading the way. How many square feet was that um, building? It was kind of towards the end of your slideshow. You said it had three windows in it and you were like south facing. Oh yeah, that was 200 square feet. Is that the one in southeast here? Yeah, okay. I made a lot of 200 square feet building because you don't need to get a permit for those. And, and it's really good to practice small scale close living quarters. Yeah, so that one's in Portland. I've saturated the little apple gate with small 200 square foot <laughs> straw bale, straw clay hybrids. Um, yeah, I can think of, there's a straw clay sauna, I think not too far from here, if it still exists, I don't know. Um, yeah. Where? <laughs> it was a BBC project just a long time ago. Who do you do commercial work? Um, the only commercial project I did was the rebuilding center over there. I'm currently not licensed, so now you can ignore everything that I said. Um, yeah, I might renew my license, depending on things. But um, yeah, it would be great. So there's also, there's an amazing human named Chris Magwood and Jenny Hammerpants who are in Ontario, Canada, and they have been pioneering panelized straw bale which is a way of building it in a factory and kind of saving a lot on the labor costs. And in my perfect world, we'd figure out a way to apply that to light straw clay. Just because I think in an urban area, it's really sometimes hard to sacrifice the square footage. So it's not a huge deal, but for some people it might make, a, it would be a deciding factor de depending on the site that you're in. So if there's a way to kind of keep the labor costs down and maybe turn it into something just a little bit more affordable for people, like I think that that would be a good thing. And then more affordability means accessibility. And for it to be more accessible for people is all about what that book is about. And I think what anybody who's in the natural building movement, it's very open source. Um, yeah, it's just better if there's more of it. So yeah, but that's a good question. Anybody else? Anybody want to build a they have? Carrie's your woman. <laughs> oh yeah, I live here. <laughs> I know, I live here. And she's licensed. Right. <laughs> I got a very special license. 
Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Last minute, Thursday night. <laughs>